by the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Have you ever seen a wonder in the glimmer of her sight? As the eyes begin to open and the blindness meets the light. If you have so say, I see the world in light, I see the world in wonder. Good morning, family. 
I hope you're all doing well today. Uh, it is an awesome privilege to be able to start our time of worship uh, together with baptism again. It seems like this is getting to be a more and more regular occurrence, which I think we could all get used to. Praise the Lord for that. I want to, uh, I want to read a few uh, verses out of God's Word uh, together as we celebrate this time and we reflect on uh, this time. And, and every, every time we baptize, I talk about how uh, this should be a reminder to us of our own baptism, of our own need for Christ and, and His work uh, of atonement in our life. And this is out of uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And this is a very uh, familiar passage of Scripture, I'm sure, uh, but, uh, but one that speaks to, to our need for Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the, curse, uh, the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath just like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The story of God's word and the story of our life is that we are sinners in need of forgiveness. We are sinners in need of pardon. Uh, we are guilty of breaking God's law. And that we deserve punishment from a holy God. But he loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to take the punishment for us, to be our substitute, and to, to, to die on the cross for us, and to defeat sin and to defeat death by rising from the dead three days later. And we understand that baptism is not an act of salvation. It's not something that by being baptized we are saved, but it is an outward expression of something that's happened inwardly. So the two people that will be baptized today, uh, this doesn't make them Christians. Uh, it simply is their confession to you as their church family uh, that Christ has saved them and that they have been redeemed and that they have been made right with God through his son Jesus. And the first thing I want you to do is if you were saved this morning, I want you to just rejoice with them and to rejoice in your own heart of your own salvation and what God's done and is doing in your life. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. And we hope that this is a testimony to you because what we're going to do is actually preaching the gospel more than anything else we'll do today. It is a picture of the death and burial and resurrection that we have with Christ. And so we pray, I pray that this is a testimony to you as well. The first person that we'll be baptizing this morning is Miss Bethany. Miss Bethany Baldwin. And she is one of our students in our student ministry. And a few weeks ago, Bethany came forward at the end of the service. Uh, and I got the chance to spend a few minutes with her uh, one Wednesday evening. When we, we talked about her relationship with the Lord and and she uh, has come to a place where she knew that she needed to be saved, that she, uh, she needed God's grace and God's forgiveness in her life. And so she gave her life to Jesus and, uh, and seeks to follow him uh, all of her life. And so, Bethany, I ask you today in front of God's people here at Taylor Road, what is your confession? Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Well, it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you then as my sister. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Next, we have Will Moore. Uh, Will is, uh, and his wife Hannah have been members here for uh, almost a year now. And, uh, and they, uh, I've had the opportunity to, to disciple Will for the last year. And, and he, uh, he shared with me his story that uh, he, he got saved and, and baptized or he prayed uh, prayer when he was a kid, much like you know me and many of you, uh, you know, when he was a child and didn't really understand uh, what God was doing in his life, but he feels like he knows uh, that he was genuinely saved by Christ when he was in college 
and, uh, and it's been, you know, that amount of time that God's been working on him that he needed to be obedient uh, and get that right. Uh, not, not being baptized before you're actually saved, but being baptized as an outward expression of, of conversion. And so uh, today it's our privilege to baptize Will. So Will, I ask you too, brother, what is your confession to this church family today? that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Well, it's my honor to baptize you as my brother in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Good morning, Taylor Road family. It is great to see everybody here on this beautiful Sunday. Uh, just a few announcements as we get started this morning. You'll find most of them in your bulletin, but a couple I want to draw your attention to on the front. Uh, we have t-shirts for sale out in the lobby. Today is the last day that you guys can buy a Taylor Road t-shirt. Uh, there are three different color options. You guys can go out there and look at them. Miss Sarah Lynn will be taking care of those. Uh, also, you'll see at the very bottom of your bulletin, uh, the Boy Scouts and Cub Scout signups is this Thursday. Uh, that will be in the student room. So if, uh, if you're interested in signing up, uh, your son for Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts, that will be over there, and Mr. Scott Whittington will be taking care of that. Uh, this, uh, this coming Sunday, one week from today, is our Taylor Road Trees to Town Bible Storyland. I know a lot of you guys, a lot of you Sunday school classes have been really, really busy trying to get all that together, but we still got a lot of work left to do. Uh, this coming Friday, we'll be putting up the Viz Queen, the tarps around the sets that have been constructed. Uh, so if you're available this Friday to come help with that, we could really, really use the help. Um, this, um, this afternoon, immediately after service uh, today, if you're going to be an actor for one of those scenes, stay right where you're at. Uh, we'll have a, an actor meeting immediately following today's service. Um, if you're a guest with us this morning, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, what we ask of you guys is the only thing that we ask of you guys. If you would take your bulletin, that little tear out tab right there. If you just take that, fill it out, drop in the offering plate or leave it on the desk on your way out. Uh, we'd appreciate it. You can also uh, grab the Taylor Road app out of, your, out of your favorite app store. And you can go to the visitors section and fill out that right there. And we'll, uh, we'd love to just uh, send you a note, give you a call to say thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll, uh, we'll stand and we'll greet each other. Uh, Father, thank you so much for just a, a beautiful start to this morning. Thank you so much uh, for the baptism uh, that we got to witness of, of Will and Bethany. Uh, thank you so much for their profession to know you as Lord and Savior. And I just pray over their lives that uh, as they go on that they, would, uh, that they would grow as disciples and they would become disciple makers themselves. Uh, I thank you so much for allowing us to be in your house this morning and just to worship you with everything that we have. And Lord, that you would just, uh, that you would just turn and speak to us through uh, Pastor Daniel's message. Uh, we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. If you would stand to your feet and find a face that you have not seen yet and, and introduce yourself. Unravel me with the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer. Yeah. 
God, we love you. Oh, I am a child of God. What a privilege it is to, to proclaim that, Father. And we thank you for that privilege. And Father, we just thank you for the beauty of the day and uh, the beauty of baptism and the reminder. Uh, Father, just speak to our pastor this morning and speak through him uh, your words, Father, for us. And uh, just continue to unify us as a church family. Uh, that way we may be effective in the community and sharing the gospel. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith.
Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Kids, you are dismissed for kids' worship. And uh, you go right ahead, make your way out right now to the lobby as your leaders are awaiting you. I am going to uh, ask you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, we, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the, uh, the guys up there on the computer, whoever's running the, the PowerPoint stuff today, to just, we're not going to worry about the, the first illustration that I had planned to play. Uh, just out of some concern that I may have about technical difficulties. But anyway, um, we, uh, I don't know, my, my, my son is, uh, y'all know, many of you know Grady, uh, but Grady thinks he is a superhero. Um, one of Grady's favorite uh, costumes right now, he, he's into costumes, uh, and one of his favorite costumes is Captain America. Anybody remember Captain America? Anybody know what I'm talking about? So any given day, if you come to the Atkins house, you're, you're going to run into Captain America, uh, or you're going to run into the Hulk. He loves the Hulk. Uh, or you might run into Spider-Man. Last night he was shooting webs at me for a little bit. Uh, imaginary webs, of course, and so I had to imaginary die for a couple of minutes. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, he, he loves the, 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 uh, the Avengers, and he loves comics, and he loves, I mean, he can't read, so I guess he loves comics as much as a kid who can't read loves comics. Uh, but he loves superheroes. And, uh, and one of our favorite movies is The Avengers. Anybody with me on that? And like, Good, three people. Uh, Awesome. This is going to sink the ship right here. But, uh, but if you'll remember in the first Avengers movie, all of the, all of the superheroes kind of have this, this running competition, right? They can't really get along, and that's really the bad guy's ploy the whole time is to, is to pit them against each other, to convince them that they don't need each other because their individual superpower is much more superior to the other, than the other ones. And so that, that's kind of the whole running uh, underlying theme of, of that movie is that eventually when they kind of put their pride aside and when they realize that one can do something that the other can't do and vice versa, then, then they're actually going to gonna get something accomplished. And, and that unfortunately runs in the church, not that we have super superpowers, but we have spiritual gifts. And that's what we're going to continue to talk about today uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that Paul begins to address kind of this superiority complex that we've been talking about. If you remember the church in Corinth, they had this superiority complex that they, they thought that the wiser that they were, or the more philosophical they were, or the more spiritual gifts that they had, the more spiritual they were, and the more blessed by God that they were. And so Paul is continuing to write to them and and address this issue. So if you've got your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to ask that you stand with me as we read God's word together. And we're going to begin in verse 12. Paul writes this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary... The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers... All suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, 
second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we now come to your table and feast on your word, uh, that you would speak to our hearts, God. We pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would, uh, that you would plant the gospel deep within our hearts, that your word would find good soil, uh, and that it would bear much fruit in our lives, that as we leave this place that we would look more like Jesus than when we arrived. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, as we continue our, our, our really mini-series within the series uh, on spiritual gifts, and in this chapter, chapter 12, uh, I want to take you back to last week real quickly as we look at really the big theme for this topic of spiritual gifts that Paul talks about and life within the body of Christ. And so what last, well, last week what we saw was this overarching truth, and it was this. So if you've got something to write with, uh, write this down. The purpose of spiritual gifts is to make much of God. The purpose of spiritual gifts is to make much of God, not make much of the recipient, not make much of me, not even make much of the church, but the purpose of spiritual gifts is to make much of God by continuing the ministry of Jesus. Remember, every spiritual gift is a reflection of Jesus' earthly ministry. It's what he did while he was on earth. And so this is Jesus' ministry continued to his church through his people. The purpose of spiritual gifts is to make much of God by continuing the ministry of Jesus and conforming his people into his image. That the end goal of spiritual gifts is to make much of God by continuing the ministry of Jesus. And as he is working through his people, he is conforming all of us into his image. And here in chapter 12, in the second part of chapter 12, we see this truth. So this is kind of the, this is the, this is the second tier to that that we will be building on and unpacking today. And it's this. That the God who gives unity to the body also gives diversity to the body. The God who gives unity to the body gives diversity to the body. You see that in chapter 12. Paul says what we just read. There is one body, but there are various gifts. There is one body, but there are many members. And there is one body. There is unity within the body, but there is also a beautiful diversity to that body. God gives unity to the body of Christ. If you look there at what we just read beginning in, chapter, in verse 12, Paul says a couple of times there is one body. We are one body in Christ. We are the body of Christ. One of the things that we talked about this past Wednesday night in our adult Bible study, and I want to encourage you, if you're not plugged into a Bible study or serving somewhere else, I want to encourage you to join us on Wednesday nights in our fellowship hall. And, uh, and I just want to take just a second and, and just say thank you to all of the different folks who are plugged into various ministries. Uh, our Awana ministry is growing, and, and I just want to thank uh, Santiago and all of the other uh, volunteers that, that take part in that each and every week. My kids are growing and they're loving it. And our choir, I mean, these guys just kill it every week, don't they? I mean, they lead us in worship and they, they rehearse. And so uh, get plugged into something on, in midweek worship, whether it's serving or in our choir and our Bible study. But this past Wednesday night, uh, we've been going through what we believe and why we believe it uh, as Christians. And we talked about uh, really the, one of the core American values uh, not a Christian value, but one of the core values, if you will, of the worldview of Western uh, culture is the autonomy of the individual. People in our culture, we value being autonomous as individuals. Nobody can tell me that I'm wrong about what I believe. I don't have to be committed to anything that I don't want to be committed to, and I don't have to have anybody tell me what to believe or how to believe it or what to, how to live or where to spend my money. I am completely autonomous as a human being. That's what ultimate freedom really is, right? That's what, that's what our culture values is, is this core value of autonomy. Everybody has a right to establish their, their own belief system, and if, if I believe it, 
It's true for me. Even if nobody else thinks it's true, it's got to be true because I believe it to be true. And no one has the right to tell me that I should believe and I don't, have the, I don't have to commit to anything that I don't feel like committing to. And all that sounds right in terms of the culture. And we can sit there and go, yeah, yeah, that's what the world believes and that's what's, what's ruining you know, America or this or that or the other. But I'm going to tell you, that worldview, that, that, that core value has crept into the church. It's infiltrated the church. I want you to look at verse 13 again. Paul says this, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. One body, one spirit. And, and this individualistic human autonomy, the, individual, uh, the autonomy of the individual has crept into the church and it, has, and it has infiltrated the church and the way that we live because no longer are, are we one body, but we're just a bunch of different consumers. You see, the average church in America today, and I'm going to tell you something, Taylor Road is no exception to any rule because we are sinners, we're fallen, we're in the flesh The average American church today is made up of consumers, not members. Every Sunday, I welcome you with a statement. Good morning, what? Family. Good morning, family. Because we believe in what I am trying to, 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 maybe you, maybe I'm giving my hand away here, but, but influence is that we are members of a family. We are not consumers to be entertained. We are not consumers to be given a product. So my question this morning is, I believe there's a difference. Are you a family member or are you a guest? Are you a family member or are you a guest? Well, my name's on the church roll. I'm not talking about if your name's on the church roll. Are you a family member or are you a guest? Every month, uh, once a month or maybe once every other month, our family hosts our home group. And you know when it's time to host home group because everybody in our family is busy. Girls are sweeping and vacuuming their rooms and, they're, and we, mom's doing this and everybody's doing that except Grady. He's running around like a superhero and we're like, as long as you don't make a mess, you just go outside. But, you know, when people come to our home, we don't hand them a broom, do we? We don't hand them a vacuum. We don't hand them the rag and the pledge and say, hey, would you just dust everything while you're here? My kids, they're young, but they do not have the right as a member of my family to sit there and watch their mom and dad do everything. Because if they do, they're guests. They're not members. They're guests. And unfortunately, the average church is filled with guests. Instead of members. And I'm going I'm to tell you, if you are a member of this family, you have a part to play in this family. As I look around this room, I'm not going to ask you to stand or raise your hand or anything like that. But if you're a member of this family, and, and there's a lot of us, there is no reason whatsoever why we should have gaps in ministries. Why, why there should be us going begging people to serve or saying we don't have enough people to serve in children's ministry or, uh, or student ministry or, or the homeless outreach or mi- mission projects or anything like that. Because, because I'm going to tell you something, most people treat the church as something that they're just consumers of. I'm going to show up on Sunday, I'm going to get fed, I'm going to feel good about myself, and then I'm going to go rather than serving the body. At Taylor Road, we're trying to build a culture where we will ask you and we will expect you. That word sounds bad to the autonomous individual, doesn't it? We will ask you and we will expect you to serve as a family member. As a family member. But y'all, it's no one's fault but ours for creating this culture, isn't it? Because we've created a culture where it's low invitation, low challenge. The staff's going to do everything. The, the people that have been members here for a long time, they're going to do everything. We believe that God has created the church and we are individually members of it. And every member has a part to play. 
has a role to play in the family. Paul says there is one spirit that we drink of. There is one body that we are a part of. There is no such thing. I've read the New Testament several times, and there is no such thing in the New Testament as a freestanding, non-committed member of the body. They, they, They didn't just choose that they didn't have the time to be active or exercise their gift. Let me say this, and, and it's not my job to, to sugarcoat things. But, but here's a truth that I think we need to come back to. Not being connected to the body may be convenient, but it's not healthy. Not being connected to the body may be convenient. To drop in whenever it's convenient. To show up and do stuff whenever it's convenient. That may be convenient, but it's not healthy. Not exercising your spiritual gift, whatever God has given you, is not healthy. The God who created unity within the body is the same God who created diversity. He gives diversity to the body. So how do we, how do we see this? I think there's two truths that I want, I want you to see. And the first one is this, that every member is of equal value to the body. Every member is is of equal value to the body. Paul talks about one baptism, drinking of one spirit, being one body. Look what he says there in verse 13. In one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. What is Paul saying there? Paul is saying it doesn't matter what color your skin is, what country you come from, what language you speak, what economic background you have, we are one body. All of that is washed away in the waters of baptism. It doesn't matter what background you come from, what life situation you've been saved from. God didn't need, it's not like you're, you're the extra sinner and I'm the guy that grew up in church so, and God needed more grace for you to save you and he, he, just, he could save some grace for me. No, 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 the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's no worse sinner and better sinner and somebody who's like not as condemned. It doesn't matter. Paul says whether you're Jew, whether you're Greek, whether you're slave, whether you're free, we are all one body. There is no hierarchy of members. There's no hierarchy of members. We don't separate the leaders from the followers based on how much money people make or what kind of car they drive. You know, you know who I like to see in leadership positions? Those who have been using and serving and, and exercising their spiritual gifts and serving faithfully. So there, there's not a hierarchy of members. There's not a hierarchy of those who have more of the Spirit either. Right? Paul, Paul warns the church in Corinth uh, against looking down on ourselves and looking down on, uh, on others. He, he says, look, look what he says in that whole section in verse 14 through 20. He says, don't look down on yourselves. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. Well, well I'm just an ear. So, so I'm not as important as the eye. Or, or, or I'm, I'm an eye, but I'm not a hand. I'm not as important as a hand. Paul says, don't look down on yourself and compare yourself to others who may be more gifted than you or who may seem to be smarter than you or who maybe seem to be further along in their walk with the Lord than you. Don't compare yourself to others. You are of one body, one spirit, the Holy Spirit. Paul says, don't look down on others. Don't compare others to yourself. We we should never be a church where we're looking around going, well, one day you'll get up to my level. What, like more pharisaical? Is that what you mean? No, I'm not the measuring rod. Jesus Christ is the measuring rod. He's the standard. Paul says, don't compare yourself to others and don't compare others to yourself. He says, just because you may be an ear doesn't mean that you should try to be an eye. And just because somebody else is an ear and they're not an eye like you are doesn't mean that you should try to convince them to be as like you. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I don't know if, you've, how, if you fly regularly, but people in first class seem to have a little bit of extra snobbery about them sometimes. Now, if you fly first class, I'm not pointing the finger at you. But ha- have you ever, and if you go on a mission trip with us, like we don't fly first class, okay? Like we're, we're in the back, Right? Where, where if something happens and the plane crashes, like we're still going to be alive because everything you see is the plane, just the tail sticking up out of the ground, right? So we're in the back. We're holding things down in the back. 
But have you ever, have you ever boarded a flight? And, you, and the people in the first class, they have like eight feet of room and they have hot meal, they have hot towels. I envy that part so much. And, and you walk through and you know where you're going and they know where you're going too. And you just walk through. I, I always carry book bags. So I'm like, man, man, to be you. And they're kind of looking at you like, just come on, don't, don't even make eye contact with me. But that's how many churches treat one another. I, I've been here longer than you. I give more than you. I've served longer than you. I, I've got this figured out. Folks, there is no hierarchy of members. Every member is of equal value to the body. Paul says we share in equality of the Spirit. We share the same relationship with God and to the church. And there should be an equality of care in the body too. Because your status is that you are an equal member of God's family. You and I owe it to each other to care for one another. This is the beauty of home groups, the beauty of Sunday school classes, because I'm going to tell you something. The staff can't be at everything. It can't be at everything. In fact, we, we, can't, we can't come see you in the hospital if we don't know you're in the hospital. I just thought I'd throw that out there. But I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, and, and, and some people may say, well, well that's, that's, that's a wrong way of thinking, preacher boy. But as a pastor, it is so refreshing and so encouraging to know that one of our members is in the hospital. And I, I go see him, or Dean or Seth or Clint goes and sees him, and they say, hey, my home group leader has already checked on me. People from my Sunday school class have already been by. They know. They're praying for me. You know why, why that's so encouraging to me? Because that's the body taking care of each other. That's one member suffering and the rest of the body suffering. That, that's, that's, that's one part of the body in a, in a tight spot that's, that's struggling and the people that are surrounding them, taking care of them and loving them. Every member is of equal value to the body, which means that God has built an interdependence into the body. Every member is of equal value to the body, but secondly, not every member is equally gifted. Not every member is equally gifted. Let me give you a little secret here. That's okay. That's okay. Every member is of equal value, but not every member is equally gifted. And that's okay, because that's the way God has designed it. This, again... It's why Paul here in, in 1 Corinthians 12 makes the illustration that the individual members of the body, right, the ear shouldn't be comparing itself to the eye or, or we shouldn't be comparing our effectiveness or giftedness to others and we, should, couldn't, we shouldn't be comparing others to ourselves as if we're the standard. In, in fact, Paul says, if you, if you read there in verses 21 through 26, Paul says it's easy to bestow honor on the parts that you see. Right? It's easy to, to glorify those parts and hold in disregard our more unpresentable or less honorable parts. Let me ask you a question. What do you spend most of the time looking in the mirror at? The thing everybody's going to see. And that, hey, I'm just going to say, ladies and guys, if, if this is true of you, we might need to talk. But you put makeup on the thing everybody sees. We tend to decorate the stuff that everybody sees. And Paul says, if we're not careful, that's how the church acts. We tend to glorify and beautify the stuff that everybody sees out front, right? The ones that have the spiritual gifts and the ones that seem to be the weaker, the ones that, that aren't out front serving, the ones that are in the, in the back serving in their spiritual gift. They're, they're the kind of the ones that we tend to shove to the back a little bit. Paul says that should not be so. He says it's easy to glorify the parts that we see and the parts that are out front and hold and disregard our more unpresentable or less honorable parts. And I think you can probably use your sanctified imagination as to what he's referring to here. He says those parts that are less honorable and unpresentable are actually, though, if you think about it, they're treated with more care. And those parts that are unpresentable and less honorable, you simply cannot live without. Think about it. Those parts that, of your body that are unpresentable, that we tend to cover with greater modesty, 
You can't live without those. Those are necessary for your survival. They are vital to your body. And Paul says the same is true of the spiritual gifts of the, of the members of the church. These areas, again, just, just again, use your sanctified imagination here because I know this. Anyway, these areas that we deem unpresentable are shown a special modesty. Their, their function is not public, or they shouldn't be public, and they are kept hidden, but they are essential to your body's survival. In the same manner, the persons with deceptively ordinary and unprestigious gifts are necessary for the proper functioning of the community as those who put on a more glittery display. You may say, well, my gift is not teaching. I'm going to tell you something. If your gift is intercessory prayer, your gift is vital to this body. Well, my gift is not you know, out front prophecy or you know, whatever may be the glorious gifts here. My, 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 my gift is the gift of giving. Your gift is vital to the body. Your gift, no matter how unpresentable you think it is, no matter how, how, how modest you may think it is, is vital to the body. All are of equal value, but it is, it is important that we understand Every member is of equal value, and every gift is vital to the body. One author said this, The church is not to be like its surrounding society, which always honors those who are already honored. It is to be countercultural and bestow the greatest honor on those who seem to be negligible. You know, as a pastor... And, and I've, I've served churches full-time now for uh, over 10 years. And it's not a long time, but it's enough time to learn human nature. And, and churches have miserable church members in them sometimes. You ever known a miserable church member? Some of you are like, no, well, you may be him or her. <laughs> but I've learned that there's three things about somebody who's just always miserable. You want to hear them? This is something that I, I think I think is accurate. Miserable church member is someone who is not exercising their spiritual gift. Consumers are miserable. Right? So when the steak doesn't come out the way they wanted it, they're going to send it back to the cook. When, when, when the service doesn't meet their demand, they're going to get uptight. You know, I found the people who are serving the most complain the least. The people who are praying the most complain the least. And I found that, that, that miserable church members uh, are, number one, those who are not exercising their spiritual gift. Secondly, I found that, that church, miserable church members are those who are exercising the wrong gift. Right? They, they think that it's more prestigious, just like the church in Corinth. They think, well, well I mean, this may be my gift, but I want that gift. I'm going to try to live that. They are living outside of their gifting. And they would say, I desire this gift. This may not be what God, you know, gave me, but this is the one that seems to get everybody's approval and everybody's applause. And you know what? They wind up being miserable. And thirdly, I've found that miserable church members are those that exercise their gift for the wrong reason. That I want the praise I want the attention. I want to be the center. I, got, I know people that if they're not the center of attention, they ain't happy. You know people like that? And the same thing can be true in the church. If I'm not, if I'm not getting the, you know, the, the honor or the, or the credit or, or the thanks or the appreciation or whatever it may be, I am not going to be happy. Rather than understanding that they've been given a spiritual gift, a particular, specific gift to make much of God to allow Jesus to continue his ministry through them and to be conformed into his image. And so I've kind of understood that that church members who are typically the miserable ones are not exercising their spiritual gift, they're exercising the wrong gift, or they're exercising their gift for the wrong reason. Now I say all that to say this, that the God who saved you, the God who is making you a new creation and who is building his church 
He knows what he has planned and purposed for you, and he knows what his church needs. God knows what he has purposed for you, planned for you, and he knows what his church needs. Not what's going to bring you the most attention, not what's going to bring you the most glory, but what his church needs the most. In fact, look, look back in your Bibles. Look back in verse 18. But as it is, who has arranged the members of the body? God, right? Look what he says. God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. And then if you skip down, Paul says again that God has appointed. God has appointed. I don't appoint myself. I don't gift myself. I don't get to pick and choose. God knows what the body needs. He knows what he has saved me for. He knows what he has created for me for. And the most pleasure that I will have in the Christian life is being right in the center of God's will, living out what he has created and saved me for. This is what I read earlier. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. God, before you were even created, before you were even born, God knew what he wanted out of your life. He knew what he was saving you for. He knew what he was destining you for. He knew what he was creating you for. And he knew what you would do for him and his glory if you would just obey him and trust him. God knows what he created you for, and he knows what his church needs. See, this again is the purpose of spiritual gifts. God uses them to conform us into his image. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says this, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together, By every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Look at verse 31. Paul says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. Earnestly desire the higher gifts. This word earnestly, this phrase earnestly desire means that you are enthusiastically and excitedly craving and pursuing. Earnestly desire, enthusiastically and excitedly craving and pursuing what God wants to and what God can do and what God will do through you. What are the higher gifts? Does that mean that the more spiritual I become, the more gifted I will be? No, what that means is what God is saying, uh, what, what the higher gifts is, what can God use most through me to minister to his body? The higher gifts is simply what God can use most effectively to minister to his body through you. And Paul says you should earnestly, enthusiastically, excitedly crave and pursue to find out what God has gifted you to do to serve his body. He gives unity to his body, but he gives diversity to his body. As we see here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, every member is of equal value to the body. But not every member is equally gifted. Every member, every Christian, every, every disciple, every follower has a spiritual gift. You have a spiritual gift if you are saved. Here's the point. Here's the point of everything I'm trying to say this morning. You matter. You matter to the body. You are vital to the body. Don't don't be like the ear who says that he's not important because he's not an eye and he can't do the same thing as the eye. You have spiritual gifts that God has given you to serve and offer to the body. So the question is, are you? Are you doing that? Are you living in obedience or are you living in disobedience? There's, There's no such thing as retirement from serving the Lord either. There's no such thing. My prayer is that God would allow me to serve him until my heart stops beating. There's no such thing as retirement from serving Christ. And so the question is today, are you a consumer or are you a member of the family? Do you understand that you matter? 
You are vitally important to this body. Listen, I want to level with you for just a second, especially our church members here today. We need you. And we need to make a declaration as a church family that we won't be a family of consumers. That's not healthy. Every church that withers and dies is a church of consumers. But every church that's healthy is a church where every member understands they are of equal value and their gifts matter. We're not going to grow as a church as consumers. You know what we'll do as consumers? We'll experience burnout. We'll experience burnout. Do we want to be a healthy body that's growing? I hope, I hope we do. I hope that we want to be a, a healthy body that's growing. And, and to do that, we need every member functioning in their God-given task. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. Coming in here, coming to Sunday school, and sitting and being served week after week after week is not a God-given task. That's easy. That's easy to do. Exercising your spiritual gift as a part of the body means that God wants to work through you to continue the ministry of Jesus to his church, to conform us into his image. And so you have a decision to make. Are you going to be a part of the body? Are you going to continue to consume? Are you going to continue to serve? Maybe you already are serving. You're exercising your spiritual gift as your pastor. I don't feel like I say this enough, and that's my fault. Thank you. Thank you for serving the body. My family benefits from your serving and your giving of your spiritual gifts. I wouldn't choose to raise my kids in any other church. And I don't just say that because I'm the pastor and I get paid to say that. That's not why I say that. But are we doing it for the right reasons? Do we understand that every member is of equal value and that every gift is vital? We need you. You Remember the old Uncle Sam posters? Yeah. Jesus is looking at you and saying, my body needs you. The body needs you. Would you bow your heads as we enter into a time of decision this morning and, and maybe God's working in your heart on, as a church member, as a, as a follower And God's leading you to step out into faith and obedience to serve him. We find a place for you to serve if it's where God wants you to serve. Maybe you've been living in disobedience. You need to come and get that, get that right with him. Maybe you're serving out of the wrong reasons, the wrong motivations, and you need to get that right with him. Maybe God's leading you to join this church family, become a part of it. Maybe God spoke to you through the preaching of the gospel through baptism. And you, ne- you recognize God spoke to your heart and said, you need to be saved. Or maybe you've been saved and, and you've never followed through in obedience with believers' baptism. And you need to get that right today. Whatever decision, I believe there, there is a multiplicity of decisions. God is working in hearts and lives in this room today. Lord, I I pray, Father, that we would be obedient to the word, that we would be obedient to your spirit as he is convicting us and conforming us into your image. And I pray, God, that you would make us a healthy body. Lord, I pray that we would understand that every member is of equal value and every gift is vital to the body. Lord, I pray that we would serve joyfully, enthusiastically, excitedly, because we serve not for the applause of men, but to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? This altar area is open. If you need to come and spend some time in prayer, get some things right with the Lord, I'll be right down here. If you need to come pray and have a decision to make, you come. soul are you weary and troubled no light in the darkness you see there
there's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the thing of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him there. Over us and no more hath no wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace Father I pray all over this room as your spirit is speaking to our hearts that we would be obedient Lord as we go out now into the great commission as we leave this place and we go as missionaries into a world that is lost and dying. I pray that we would share the good news of Jesus this week. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, before we dismiss, I want to let you know that again, Friday night, we're going to be having a time of prayer walking uh, in the field back here uh, at five o'clock. So if you uh, want to come and just pray over the field before Bible Storyland? Uh, we'd love to have you. And it's just going to be a come and go thing. And we just want to cover that place in prayer. And then also, if you are, uh, have been asked or signed up to act uh, for Bible Storyland, or if neither one, you're just like, hey, I want to help out with that, um, we're going to have just a brief meeting in here uh, in just a few minutes. So if you would, just come fill up the first couple of rows. And, uh, and we'd love to have anybody. There's no, no lines required. You don't have to speak at all. You just kind of have to pantomime it. So uh, Clint mentioned Friday uh, working out there. So if you can come help with that, that would be awesome. You guys have a great rest of the week and we will send you Wednesday night as we are dismissed. Let's all sing together how glad we are to be a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined as with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family.